All right, well, um, I'm going to go straight into security then, and uh, probably looking for an early end, which I'm sure no one's going to complain about. So I want to talk about just some principles for securing your, uh, your data. And um, security is an extraordinarily broad topic, so I want to quantify specifically what I'm talking about. Uh, I, we've done some work on trying to position where Flowgear fits into the, the, the space here. Um, I think things like citizen integrated tools are a very different category. Those are all inherently multi-tenant platforms. They have to be because the, the you know, costings don't work any other way. Um, and the level of control that you can exert over those platforms is, is extremely limited, and, and that's why there generally isn't a huge uptake in enterprise. Um, but what we're specifically talking about is IPaaS, or Integration Platform as a Service, and what you can look at doing to uh, kind of start on a, a security journey there. Um, it may not be obvious why uh, an integration platform is such a, an area, or should be such an area of concern from a security perspective. But if you think about it, it, it holds an extraordinary amount of information. Um, there isn't really any other system that has connect to, you know, credentials and connection information to all of the other apps and services. So, so for that reason alone, and um, in, in some ways, it's somewhat surprising that there haven't been uh, malicious actors that have targeted middleware platforms. There's been tons of things like, you know, supply chain attacks. I've not heard of, of one targeting uh, an integration platform, but to me, it, it would actually be an effective target. So what I want to talk about is things that you can do to uh, uh, start protecting yourself. And of course, there's no sort of one size fits all, and there's a ton of different dimensions to this. So we're just really going to focus on five different areas that you can watch out for. First, we'll look at user access. So how do people gain access to the platform, log in and do stuff in it? Then we'll look at how we're storing sensitive information that the platform needs in order to be able to do its work. We'll talk about how the workload is actually executed, uh, the logging that it does, and then change management, which we've already discussed at some length. So first thing is that you really don't want to use a platform that does its own login. Uh, we moved away from that on our legacy platform in our new platform. Uh, we're, we're using providers like Microsoft and Google. Uh, we're using a, a standard called OpenID Connect. Um, you can use uh, SAML as well. And so the idea is that the identity provider is responsible for enforcing whether a user gets in or not. Um, so we are using them for authentication, but not authorization purposes. So that's to say we can trust that they are who they claim to be based on what the identity provider tells us. But the authorization, what they're allowed to do, is still governed within Flowgear. And that might be something that we look at uh, tying more deeply into the identity provider over time. So if you look at something like uh, Microsoft Entra, formerly Active Directory, you're going to create your uh, list of users in there. Uh, you can then apply a lot of different policies, so things like um, single sign-on, multi-factor access, and so on. And so all of those things combined help you have a lot of assurance around who's allowed into the system. Uh, you can have you know, various policies. We have some customers that literally don't want access to the platform from outside of their office IP address. You can apply those policies because if no one can sign in from anything but a certain IP, then they can't do anything. And so it's, it's really nice to be able to apply that policy centrally. And then, of course, you get uh, an, a tamper-proof third-party audit trail of things like long and attempts. And certainly within the context of Azure, there's a lot of alerting that you can build around unusual activity. And Microsoft is doing a ton of work around um, AI-driven uh, analysis of that. I, I think one of the challenges actually with proactive alerting is it can just be too much. And how do you make sense of it when there's a thousand data points? And I think um, AI is showing a, a huge amount of success being able to help you prioritize meaningfully and get through you know, useful stuff. So an identity provider that's external to the platform is, is a great start, which is what we do. With respect to uh, credentials, um, you, you pretty much want to work on least privilege. One problem is that the access control on APIs is normally a lot less granular than the front end. And I think JJ made this comment earlier. If I'm in the front end of my ERP, I can create custom security groups, I can control like you know, this department can access this, or these customers can access this warehouse, but not that one. It's, it's normally very granular. And APIs generally don't afford that level of granularity, so you do need to be very careful. But where possible, you should use some kind of credential that has the least required level of privilege uh, 
for the endpoint that you're talking to. Generally, you want to try and avoid having to store a username and password. Uh, a lot of products still do require that for API integration, and certainly if you're doing RPA, then that might be uh, the only option available to you. But a better option would be some kind of service token. So you've negotiated um, access to a resource. There are a, a couple of different standards out there. One of them is um, OAuth. So what OAuth is going to do is allow a user to sign into a service and authorize access to that service for Flowgear and then issue a token to Flowgear, which it can then use to request certain data. But Flowgear itself never handles that user's credential. So that kind of um, you know, separation of those roles is, is very good. And that's one form that a service token can take. Uh, a variation on that is something called a shared access signature. And that's when you have multiple things that need to access the same resource. Um, you can have uh, a, different a different type of token available for each of those consumers. So you can tell consumer one apart from consumer two. Again, just good practice because that's going to show up in your access logs and you can then take decisions based on that. And then probably the, the best option available is to just not have to store any credential at all. And a few years back, Microsoft came out with a uh, capability called managed identity. And what this is is instead of uh, the component that needs access proving that it's entitled to it with a credential. Instead, it just has a, its own identity, but um, Azure around it is responsible for affirming that it is permitted that access. So what's really neat about this is you literally don't have any credentials. If you've granted access from within Azure, then Azure itself will validate that the service is allowed that particular access, and that's the end of it. So we're using managed identity. For example, when um, our platform spins up on a virtual machine, it needs to connect to the storage account. It's actually using managed identity to assert its access. Another thing that you can do here is if you are using like a Flowgear drop point to integrate with an on-prem resource, let's say you're integrating a, a Microsoft SQL database, uh, you might default to using a username and password. A better option is to use Windows authentication so then you don't need to supply a username and password in your connection in Flowgear. Instead, at the drop point service in Windows, you're going to run that service under a specific user account that already has the rights uh, to that database. And that's a really neat way to do it because, again, it means that Flowgear doesn't even need to have a record of those credentials. That um, authentication is being delegated out and it's being handled by that Windows server effectively. So those are, are points worth considering. As to where we actually store this data, um, in Flowgear we use Microsoft Key Vault, and that's obviously considered best practice for Azure. If you're using AWS, they have a, an equivalent store. Uh, but Key Vault is a, a purpose-built uh, service. It allows you to store things like tokens, keys, and, and certificates, and then has extremely granular access control around which identities or which users or services are able to uh, read and, and write those resources and then obviously has a lot of um, audit uh, or policy that you can build in, in, an auditable uh, record of those actions. Again, this is another area that's, that's pretty useful for customers because this is kind of a, um, a, a sensitive data hotspot. We can give customers on our pro and enterprise plans direct access to that key vault. Um, and so they're able to add additional policies. So if, if they need you know, more information or, or to be able to lock it down beyond what we do um, out the gate, then they're able to take advantage of that as well. So when we, when we started in sort of early 2010, one of the biggest things we actually had to convince customers of is why would you use a cl cloud platform for integration? We're, we're not having so many of those conversations anymore. Um, but there certainly still is a place for an on-premise workload versus a cloud workload. So I'll just weigh up those, those two options. Um, and in Flowgear, although most of our customers are taking our cloud offering, we do offer um, either an on-prem or an own tenant offering around the, the platform as well. So the own tenant option is if you're an Azure customer, we can deploy your Flowgear tenant inside your Azure tenant. So you can kind of uh, virtually ring fence that as far as you need. And then we do have an on-prem option as well where we can have an, a highly available uh, runtime and you'll, you'll interact with that 
but it's on-prem. So obviously the advantage of, of cloud is that it's, it just works for you. You don't have to worry about complexities around patching and, and uptime. Um, whereas uh, on-prem, it's easier to make, it's, it's in a way easier to reason about what data is leaving the network because you can just put a firewall on it, allow nothing out, and then you know at least nothing is emanating directly uh, out of the platform. So there is a, an initial kind of high level of control. I will say though that even in our cloud environment, we do offer a, we have a, a VNet per customer. So you can actually apply things like um, you know, various types of network policy if you need to restrict access to that further. One of the, the strengths of a cloud platform is in some ways its weakness as well, right? If someone unintentionally connects to the wrong service, suddenly you're sending data where it shouldn't need to be. So think about what the, the risk around that might be. Um, one way to control this is, for the most part, the endpoints that you're connecting to are restricted to the specific connections that you've created. So perhaps it's the security architect's role to build those connections, uh, define them and test them, and the implementers actually don't have the ability to make those changes. So that there are different mitigations that you can do to, to reduce risk around that. And um, you know, by contrast, on an on-prem environment, you're going to have to do some uptime yourself. Um, I won't mention any names, but we consistently see our on-prem customers with a lot more downtime. Um, it's not that easy to manage. There's, there's always something going on. Um, it's somewhat ironically, we, we did have a quite a significant um, Azure outage in South Africa uh, three, three, four weeks ago. Um, and we were able to move load over to a different Azure data center, the Cape Town data center, and we're all good. But kind of managing that um, in an on-prem environment is very difficult. So, you know, if you, you've suddenly lost some servers and your process goes down, it's, it's much harder to recover from that. Um, in cloud, there are two, there's one specific thing to, to look out for, and that's what the tenancy model is. I alluded to this earlier. Uh, we use a separate set of VMs per customer, so you can't have one customer interfering with, each, with another. But what you do need to just think about is, where you're using uh, sites in Flogia, uh, who the stakeholders or the owners of those individual sites are. So in, in our platform, we have the tenant at the top, and then those tenants can be partitioned into sites, and the higher plans have more sites within them. But those sites are not intended as a security boundary. So although you can lock down user access, fundamentally when those integrations run, they can traverse those boundaries. So just be cognizant of that and understand um, you know, if you need more isolation, then it's actually best to create a separate tenant. And um, on-prem, th this is also not well uh, understood, but you basically need to treat all of your integration workload as hostile. Um, for example, if, if I have a CRM and I save a customer record, almost the worst thing I can do is save some bad data uh, into that customer record. Whereas with an integration platform, I have a connector to access the file system, call databases, uh, try and find services on the network, pretty much anything. So if, if someone malicious got in there, um, they'd be able to do quite a bit of damage. And so for that reason, it's a, also a good practice to have extra controls around your deployed on-prem platform to reduce its access, literally kind of at the network layer, reduce the services that it has uh, access to. In a public cloud, we run a, a web app gateway with a firewall on the front. Um, and this is also something that we're allowed to, we're able to customize quite significantly for our pro and enterprise customers. So by default, you're gonna be able to get access to the platform over an internet breakout. But for customers who require it, we can lock down that access so that you can only connect, say, from your office IP address um, uh, or only from you know, certain countries, for example, if you don't operate in a certain country, maybe you don't want to allow any of that access at all. Um, and then you can extend that policy further. So you might have policies based on time of day or things like maximum payload size. We can accommodate all of those things um, for you as part of your deployment. Uh, and in some cases, actually, we, uh, if, if you don't, we, we have this with some banks. Um, where you don't want traffic to run over the internet, we can do a peering on a, via a backplane so that you peer straight into a virtual network and that traffic is not going over the internet at all. So happy to make those accommodations if you're interested in that. So let, let's talk about logs. Um, logs are really intended for diagnostic purposes. Um, many years back there were 
uh, stories about how web server logs were accidentally, or, or they were leaked, and within them, uh, credentials had accidentally been stored. So, you know, back in the day, even if you had a secure connection, you'd maybe capture the user's username and password in the query string of the URL, and guess what? That actually gets logged uh, in a text file on the web server, and people didn't realize that. And so, you know, an, an attacker would get in, and, and now those credentials are exposed. Um, and in a similar way, you, you do have to take some care around what you're logging inside the platform. Um, generally speaking, any uh, step that runs in a workflow is going to be logged, and we're going to log the input properties on that step and then the output properties on, on the reverse of that, on, on completion of that step. So that's very useful when something breaks, but unfortunately, uh, you know, 99% of the time, you never need those logs again. It's just you don't know which 1% you need when you need it, so you, you kind of default to logging everything. So it's important to have some kind of level of, of balance on this. Uh, we offer a few different options here. We recommend that once something is deployed in production, you disable lo uh, logging except for errors by default. That's actually also going to increase your throughput a little bit because sometimes the logging is actually slower than the steps that are running in the platform. Um, and uh, if you're just recording the error messages, there is some measure of risk in that, but it's far below a verbose logging of everything that's taking place. Um, we also offer a redaction feature. So literally on the design of the workflow, you can pick specific properties that need to be redacted. So for instance, if you're capturing a credit card, you can redact that property. The one care that needs to be taken with that is you might have a step that you've redacted a property, but then further down you're using the output of that at another step. So you kind of need to follow that the whole way down the chain and make sure you've been very thorough. And that would be then something that your customers or, or the, that your QA team should take into account when they're uh, reviewing. And then finally, uh, make sure that you don't have any credentials stored within the uh, workflow design itself. There are some very um, unlikely edge cases where it's very difficult to avoid this, but generally, if you're using uh, Flowgear connections, it's impossible for that connection data to be stored in the log. So use connections. Um, one thing that we've seen a few times is uh, customers need to connect to, say, 50 different databases, and they don't want to create 50 different connections, so they kind of inject them in, and now the credentials are there in the workflow design. Um, but you can actually dynamically inject connections into the workflow design as well. So you build those 50 connections, and then you can dynamically inject them by referencing them with a, an, an ID. And that means that you don't have to explicitly put credentials into the workflow design. So we strongly recommend using that approach. And then just like all things with respect to security, um, it's, it's never done. So as you're going through these different iterations, you need to think about where you need to apply less control and then ultimately more control and specifically have a formal review process in place that's worth like a peer review process would in traditional software. Um, you can build workflows that test workflows. Again, this kind of models the way that a software developer would work well, they'll, where they'll build um, test suites out for a particular feature. Um, so those are all good practices. And then uh, the uh, automated ability to publish something into production without being able to then tamper with that design in production is a good um, control mechanism as well. So that's the review process that we spoke about a little earlier, your ability to control exactly when something hits a different environment. These are three environments set up here. Uh, every environment that you add actually creates some overhead. So we have a lot of customers who only use two. If you don't have three uh, types of endpoints for every product, you probably don't want three environments. So if you just have a test environment and a prod, you should just have uh, uh, two environments set up correspondingly in Flowgia. So that's it. And uh, we've looked at uh, the best way to secure uh, user access. So use an independent identity provider. We talked about using uh, connections inside Flowgia to securely store credentials. We talked about some of the concerns around where the workload executes, whether it's uh, on-prem or in the cloud. We've considered some aspects around the activity logs, and then finally, what that change management process should look like for a good security posture. All right, thank you. Are there any questions there? We've kind of covered a lot of it a little earlier, so I'm happy to elaborate in more detail if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, on replication, do you guys on uh, replication, do you guys uh, replicate VMs for 
each client or uh, for each client, let's say if you you deploy a VM for them and it's in Cape Town, mm -hmm. do you replicate to other data centers or is it just only one uh, data center? It, uh, it depends on the plan that they're on. So the backing services that we use, the storage accounts are um, uh, globally redundant replicated. So uh, that data replicates to a secondary region. Um, and if Azure had, for example, a full uh, data center outage, we'd be able to have a read access to that data. And that's actually all we need because in the case of such a significant outage, all we want to do is make sure we can continue to process workloads. So if we can still read you know, workflow designs and credentials and that sort of thing. When it comes to the VMs, what we do is, depending on the plan that you're on, we create a, a certain size of cluster. And then on our higher plans, we have a, a full DR environment as well. Now, those VMs aren't replicated. We don't actually need to transfer state. So they're just fresh VMs spun up with the appropriate version of our platform. And then we use a, a, a load balancer to route traffic to primary or secondary and we run health probes to determine whether we're getting responsiveness from that, that environment. If they start to become unresponsive for a period of time, then we'll do an automated failover to the secondary. So the DR, whether you have DR, is governed by a subscription, and that's going to be informed by what you need operationally. So we have some customers who have important processes, but they're batch-driven, and they really don't mind in the, in, in the very rare event of a data center level issue. You know, they could live with that for a few hours, whereas others are doing real-time inbound API invoked. They really don't want to ever go down, and those customers need a DR environment. Anything else? All right, well, thank you for joining me.